this is Dr. Bev Knox, your psychology study buddy. I'm here to help you pass your psychology course. So let's get started, okay? First off, define psychology. Psychology is the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. Repeat after me in your mind. Psychology is the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. Define it. What is psychology? Let's do it again. Psychology is the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. Thinking smarter is called critical thinking. So let's define that. Critical thinking examines assumptions, appraises the source, discerns hidden biases, evaluates evidence, and assesses conclusion. So what is critical thinking? Critical thinking is thinking that does not blindly accept arguments and conclusions. Rather, it examines assumptions, appraises the source, and discerns hidden biases. You must evaluate the evidence that's put forth in front of you, and you must assess the conclusions. So. What is critical thinking? In short, just remember, thinking that does not blindly accept arguments and conclusions. What is critical thinking? That's right. It's thinking that does not blindly accept arguments and conclusions. Okay, let's move on. What is the empirical approach? Well, it's evidence-based method. Now remember that in the, in the definition. It is an evidence-based method that draws an observation and experimentation. So what is the empirical approach? An evidence-based method that draws down observation and experimentation. Now let's have you try it. What is an empirical approach? Say it in your mind. I could hear you. You're right. An empirical approach is an evidence-based method that draws on observation and experimentation. Now let's talk about psychology as a science. What were some important milestones in psychology's early development? Well, as we know, to be human is to be curious about ourselves and the world around us. Before 300 BCE, the Greek naturalist and philosopher Aristotle theorized about learning and memory, motivation and emotion, perception and personality. Today, we chuckle at some of his guesses, like his suggestion that a meal makes us sleepy caused by gas and heat to collect around the source of our personality, which is the heart. But credit Aristotle with asking the right questions. Now, what does this have to do with psychology? Well, first of all, please note, Psychology didn't just start 111 years ago. You could say modern psychology started then. But Greek naturalists, early philosophers like Aristotle, 
actually theorized about some of the same concepts that we work on today in psychology. So yes, psychology is now considered a science. Before long, this new science of psychology became organized into different branches or schools of thought, each promoted by pioneering thinkers. Two early schools of thought were structuralism and functionalism. Okay, so structuralism is the early school of thought promoted by Wundt and Techner used introspection to reveal the structure of the human mind. So as early physicists and chemists discerned the structure of matter, so did psychologist Edward Bradford Techner aim to discover the mind's structure. He engaged people in self-reflective introspection. Remember this definition because you need to know it. So in structuralism, they used introspection, and introspection means looking inward, training people to report elements of their experience as they smelled a scent or tasted a substance. What were their immediate sensations, their images, their feelings? So introspection basically is the person looking inward and reporting what they see, feel, smell, etc. So structuralism technique of introspection proved somewhat unreliable. It required smart verbal people and its results varied from person to person and experience to experience. As introspection weaned itself away, so did structuralism. So we started off with structuralism. Again, we're talking about the two early schools of thought, which is structuralism and functionalism. So structuralism used introspection to explain things. And introspection, don't forget, is the person looking inward, okay? So structuralism is an early school of thought promoted by whom? Promoted by Wundt and Techner. They used introspection to reveal the structure of the human mind. What is structuralism? Correct. It is an early school of thought promoted by Wundt and Techner. And what did they use? That's right, they used introspection. And what is introspection? Looking inward to reveal the structure of the human mind. Now, let's move on to functionalism. Functionalism is an early school of thought promoted by James and influenced by Darwin. It explored how mental and behavioral processes function, how they enable the organism to adapt, survive, and flourish. So with functionalism, philosopher slash psychologist William James thought it would be more fruitful to consider the evolved functions of our thoughts and feelings. Smelling is what the nose does. Thinking is what the brain does. But why do the nose and the brain do these things? Under the influence of evolutionary theorist Charles Darwin, James assumed that thinking, like smelling, developed because it was adaptive. 
It helped our ancestors survive and reproduce. So what is functionalism? Functionalism is an early school of thought promoted by William James and influenced by whom? Charles Darwin. It explored how mental and behavioral processes function and how they enable the organism to adapt, survive, and flourish. So what is functionalism? That's right. Functionalism is an early school of thought promoted by William James and influenced by Charles Darwin. It explored how mental and behavioral processes function and how they enable the organism to adapt, survive, and flourish. In psychology's early days, many psychologists shared with the English essayist C.S. Lewis the view that there is one thing and only one in the whole universe which we know more about, and that one thing is ourselves. Now, in psychology, there are many different types of psychological perspectives. There isn't just one way to look at anything. So let's go over a few of the major perspectives in psychology. And you have to know the difference between each of them. Let's first start off with behaviorism. Behaviorism is the view that psychology should be an objective science and it studies behavior without reference to mental processes. Behaviorism is the view that psychology should, one, be an objective science, and two, it studies behavior without reference to mental processes. Most psychologists today agree with the first one, which is it should be an objective science but they do not agree with the second one, which is to study behavior without reference to mental processes. But in behaviorism, the belief is behaviors are learned. Human behaviors are learned. So with behaviorism, that definition endured until 1920 when the first of two provocative American psychologists appeared on the scene. That would be John B. Watson and later B.F. Skinner. They dismissed introspection and redefined psychology as the scientific study of observable behavior. After all, they said, science is rooted in observation. What you cannot observe and measure, you cannot scientifically study, is what they said. You cannot observe a sensation, a feeling, or a thought. So they completely rejected introspection. So, what is behaviorism? That's right. The view that psychology would be an objective science. And later on in another quiz study session, you and I will talk about conditioning, such as classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning, which all falls under behaviorism. Who are the two major names under behaviorism? John B. Watson and later B. F. Skinner. And we will talk about those names later on. Let's move on to humanistic psychology. Humanistic psychology is historically significant because that perspective can emphasize human growth and potential. 
So as the behaviorists had rejected the early 1900s definition of psychology, other groups rejected the behaviorist definition. In the 1960s, for example, humanistic psychologists led by Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow, these are two names you need to remember, okay? So under humanistic psychology, also known as humanism, it was led by Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. They found both behaviorism and Freudian psychology too limited. We'll talk about Freud in a minute. But again, humanistic psychologists led by Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow found both behaviorism and Freudian psychology too limited. So again, humanistic psychologists led by whom? Who led the humanistic psychology? Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. Did they agree with behaviorism? No, they did not agree with behaviorism or with Freudian psychology because they said it was too limited. Rather than focusing on conditioned responses, because that's what behaviorism focused on, conditioned responses using classical conditioning or operant conditioning or even observational learning. Psychologists in the 1960s pioneered a cognitive revolution, leading the field back to the early interests in how our mind processes and retains information. So cognitive psychology today continues its scientific exploration of how we perceive, process, and remember information. So cognitive psychology is the study of mental processes, such as occur when we perceive, learn, remember, think, communicate, and solve problems. What is cognitive psychology? Yes, it is the study of mental processes such as occur when we perceive, when we learn, how we remember and think, how we communicate, and how we solve problems. If you were to give me a one word definition for cognitive psychology, I would want you to use the word thinking. Whenever you try to explain something that is going on, remember, thinking process, the way the person thinks about a particular thing, that is cognitive psychology. Now, the marriage of cognitive psychology, the science of the mind, and neuroscience, the science of the brain, gave birth to cognitive neuroscience. This is a specialty with researchers in many disciplines, studies the brain activity underlying mental activity. So cognitive neuroscience is the interdisciplinary study of the brain activity linked with cognition, which is including perception, thinking, memory, and language. What is cognitive neuroscience? Cognitive neuroscience is the marriage or blending or fusion of cognitive psychology, which is the science of the mind, and neuroscience, 
which is the science of the brain. Cognitive neuroscience is the study of the brain activity linked with cognition. Let's move on to evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychology is the study of the evolution of behavior and the mind using principles of natural selection. So evolutionary psychology is the scientific study of evolution of behavior and the mind using principles of natural selection. But what is natural selection? Natural selection is the principle that inherited traits that better enable an organism to survive and reproduce in a particular environment will most likely be passed on to succeed in generations. So, Evolutionary psychology is the study of the evolution of behavior and the mind using principles of natural selection. But are our human traits inherited? That's something we need to think about. Or do they develop through experience? And this has been psychologist's biggest question and most persistent issue. The nature-nurture debate. The Greek philosopher Plato, who lived between 828 and 348 BCE, assumed that we inherited character and intelligence and that certain ideas were inborn. So he believed in the nature perspective, which basically says one is made up by their biological and genetic influences. So that was Plato's perspective. Aristotle, who lived between 384 and 322 BCE, countered that there is nothing in the mind that does not first come from the external world throughout the senses. So he took a nurture approach. And nurture simply means environmental influence contributes to who we are. So the nature perspective states biological and genetic influences make up who we are, but the nurture perspective states it's environmental influences that make up who we are. So, the nature-nurture debate is a long-standing, very controversial debate over the relative contributions that genes and experience make up the development of psychological traits and behaviors. Today's science sees traits and behaviors arising from the interaction of both nature and nurture. Let's move on to behavior genetics. Behavior genetics is the study of the relative power and limits of genetic and environmental influences on behavior. What is behavior genetics? Behavior genetics is the study of the relative power and limits of genetic and environmental influences on behavior. Let's move on to cultural influences. Define culture. Let's do that first. Culture is the enduring behaviors, ideas, attitudes, values and traditions shared by a group of people and transmitted from one generation to the next. What is culture? Culture is the enduring behaviors, ideas, attitudes, values, and 
and traditions shared by a group of people and transmitted from one generation to the next. As we will see time and time again, culture matters. Our culture shapes our behavior. It influences our standards. It is also true, however, that our shared biological heritage unites us as a universal human family. The same underlying processes guide people everywhere. Define culture. Culture is the enduring behaviors, ideas, attitudes, values, and traditions shared by a group of people and transmitted from one generation to the next. So, is culture important in understanding psychology? Of course it does. Col someone's cultural background is is very important when trying to understand that person's behavior and when trying to determine whether or not um, that particular behavior is normal or abnormal according to that society. So culture is majorly important when trying to understand human behavior. Let's move on now to the psychodynamic perspective. Psychodynamic focuses on how behavior springs from unconscious drives and conflicts. For example, how can someone's personality traits and disorders be explained by unfulfilled wishes and childhood trauma? Freudian psychology, which emphasized the ways our unconscious mind and childhood experiences affect our behavior. So just remember the psychoanalytic perspective is called Freudian psychology. I want you to remember Sigmund Freud pioneered this perspective. And this perspective dealed with the emphasis of our unconscious mind and our childhood experiences and how those childhood experiences, uh, whether it's good or bad, affect our behaviors today. Okay, so moving right along to positive psychology. Psychology's first hundred years often focused on underlining and treating troubles, such as abuse and anxiety, depression and disease, prejudice and poverty. Most of, today, most of today's psychologists, for example, continues the exploration of such challenges. Without slighting the need to repair damage and cure disease, Martin Seligman and others called for more of a positive type of research focusing on human flourishing. So these psychologists called this approach positive psychology. They believed that happiness is a byproduct of a pleasant, engaged, and meaningful life. Thus, positive psychology uses scientific methods to explore the building of a good life that engages our skills and a meaningful life that points beyond ourselves. So, what is positive psychology? Positive psychology is the scientific study of human flourishing, with the goals being to discover and promote one's strengths and virtues that help individuals and communities thrive. So positive psychology is one of the fastest growing fields in psychology. It focuses on human prospering, human flourishing on their strengths rather than on their weaknesses.
There are many, many, many different psychological perspectives, and we went over just a few. For example, neuroscience, evolutionary perspective, behavior genetics, psychodynamic, behavioral, cognitive. There's also social cultural perspective, and it focuses on how behavior and thinking vary across situations and cultures. And we talked about that earlier, how culture is majorly important in understanding human behavior. Well, there's a perspective for that too. It's called social cultural perspective. How behavior and thinking vary across situations and cultures. So in psychology, you have different perspectives and the perspectives are like your social, cultural, your cognitive, behaviorism, humanism, uh, psychodynamic, behavior genetics, evolutionary, neuroscience. So these are the different perspectives in psychology. Now there are different subfields in psychology. So you have to know the difference between a perspective, which is what we've been going over, and a subfield in psychology. And subfields use uh, different perspectives, okay? The cluster of subfields we call psychology is a meeting ground for different disciplines. Psychology is a hub scientific discipline and association for psychological science. So this is a perfect home for those with wide ranging interests. In its diverse activities from biological experimentation to cultural comparisons, the tribe of psychology is united by a common quest which is describing and explaining behavior and the mind underlining it. Some psychologists conduct basic research that builds psychology's knowledge base. So basic research means pure science that aims to increase the scientific knowledge base. Basic research is the pure science that aims to increase the scientific knowledge base. What is basic research? That's right. It is pure science that aims to increase the scientific knowledge base. What is applied research? Applied research is the scientific study that aims to solve practical problems. What is applied research? Applied research is the scientific study that aims to solve practical problems. So psychology is a science, but also a profession that helps people have healthier relationships, overcome anxiety and depression, and raise thriving children. Counseling psychologists help people to cope with challenges and crises including academic, vocational, and relationship issues, and to improve their personal and social functioning. What is counseling psychology? Counseling psychology is a branch of psychology that assists people with problems in living often related to school, work, or marriage, and in achieving greater well-being. What is counseling psychology?
Counseling psychologists help people to cope with challenges and crises, including academic, vocational, and relationship issues, and to improve their personal and social functioning. Let's move on to clinical psychologists. Clinical psychologists assess and treat people with mental, emotional, and behavior disorders. Clinical psychologists assess and treat people with mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders. Clinical psychology is a branch of psychology that studies, assesses, and treats people with psychological disorders. Both counseling and clinical psychologists administer and interpret tests, provide counseling and therapy, and sometimes conduct basic and applied research. By contrast, Psychiatrists, who also may provide psychotherapy, are medical doctors licensed to prescribe drugs and otherwise treat physical causes of psychological disorders. So there is a distinct difference between counseling psychologists, clinical psychologists, and a psychiatrist. Now, Psychiatry is a branch of medicine dealing with psychological disorders practiced by physicians who are licensed to provide medical, for example, drug or prescription treatments, as well as psychological therapy. So psychiatry is a branch of medicine dealing with psychological disorders. Psychiatrists who also may provide psychotherapy are medical doctors licensed to prescribe drugs and otherwise treat physical causes of psychological disorders. So you may call a counseling psychologist and a clinical psychologist and psychiatrists doctors. They all have their doctorate, but counseling psychologists who may have a PhD, clinical psychologists who may have a PhD or a PsyD, and your psychiatrist would have an MD. So your counseling and clinical psychologists went to graduate school to get their graduate degree. Your psychiatrist went to medical school. So psychiatrists are a medical doctor. They went to medical school. Your counseling and clinical psychologist went to graduate school. So what is the difference between a clinical psychologist and a psychiatrist? Yes, yes, you are right. A clinical psychologist went to graduate school. They assess and treat people with mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders. Psychiatrists, on the other hand, went to medical school. They may also provide psychotherapy. They are medical doctors licensed to prescribe drugs and otherwise treat physical causes of psychological disorders. So, counseling psychologists, clinical psychologists, and psychiatrists may see patients and help them improve their personal lives, including academic, vocational, and relationship issues, including mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders, including psychotherapy, as well as counseling therapy. But 
psychiatrists went to medical school and they can prescribe medication where counseling psychologists and clinical psychologists cannot. They are a few states that allow a clinical psychologist, a PhD, to prescribe medication. New Mexico is was the first state to actually do so, and you have more states following suit. Psychology also influences modern culture. Knowledge transforms us. Psychology deepens our appreciation for how we humans perceive, think, feel, and act. By doing so, it can enrich our lives and enlarge our vision. Please listen to my upcoming psychology quiz study guide. We will focus on research studies how psychologists ask and answer questions.